a picture is worth a thousand words. That's a famous quote used to describe the effect that seeing something leaves a much greater impact than being told about it. And Hyperlight Drifter, an action-adventure game released by Heart Machine in 2016, takes this quote to heart in the telling of its story, using its gorgeous environments and the struggles and challenges its characters go through to show, rather than tell, the story. There are rare occurrences of dialogue and written lore in the game, but that dialogue uses artwork instead of words to get the message of the conversation across, and the lore is written in a cipher that requires players to decode it to find out its meaning. All of this creates a unique experience that's unlike most other games out there. But unfortunately, it can leave some people confused on what actually happens in the game and why. So even though it will pale in comparison to experiencing it ourselves, let's go through all that's shown over the course of the game and piece it all together so we can see the story of Hyperlight Drifter in full. Of course, spoilers for the game are ahead, so this is your warning to click away and experience the story of the game yourself before watching, which I recommend you do. It's a much more satisfying experience that way. But with that out of the way, let's get started. The story begins on an island continent known as the Land of Light. In each of the cardinal directions of this vast land, there were distinct environments that differentiated the respective region from the other parts of the country. In the north were tall, snow-capped mountains. In the east were wide wetlands that surrounded a large lake. In the south were the sun-scorched sands of a large desert. And in the west was an expansive forest of trees that stretched for miles. And in each of these environments, there were various indicators that vast, complex societies once called these lands home. There were statues, fountains, and totems all over the woods, mountains, and wetlands. There were remnants of large temples and residential structures in the caves, trees, and shores. There were expansive tunnels full of light and machines running under the surface of the regions. And there were rusted out chassis of spectacular automatons scattered throughout the land. However, while all these artifacts suggested that these societies were powerful and capable and technologically advanced, there were others that suggested they had a sudden and deadly downfall. Skeletons picked clean of their meat were a common sight in every single region. The remains of large cannon-like weapons could be seen alongside the rusted out automatons. And most striking of all, the remains of gigantic mechanical titans lied in a devastated area in each region of the land, all close to the cultural center of the societies. The mystery of what caused the downfall of these societies was what brought entities known as Drifters to the Land of Light. Drifters were people that explored the ruins of the world in order to find lost technologies and learn ancient history, and one Drifter, known only as the Librarian, came to the Land of Light to find out what happened to its people. After countless hours of exploring the ruins and conducting research in a vast library, the Librarian was able to piece together a picture of what each society was like and what ultimately happened to them, documenting their history in huge monoliths scattered across the land and in her private library. In the wetlands of the east, the Librarian found that a society of otter people used to live in the stone structures standing in the waters of the lake, and the defining characteristic of their culture was their reverence of a unique material not seen anywhere else in the Land of Light. A bright magenta flame that burned with an eternal light. These flames, which were called hyperlight, were just as, if not more important than the waters of their home to the otters, featuring prominently in their temples and upon their statues. In fact, their fascination with the substance went to the point of obsession, and for a long time, they hoarded the material, unwilling to share it with the other cultures on the island for fear of having it taken away from them. This fear was likely due to a race of toads that shared the region with the otters, a folk that would raid the home of the otters in an attempt to get their hands on the hyperlight. In the west, just like in the east, there was a material unique to the region. Large green crystals that grew all over the trees and plants of the forest, a substance that came to be known as hard light, and the prominent culture of the area, a warrior society of raccoons, used the material in the weapons and armor of their soldiers, furnishing their pauldrons with shards of the substance and using its sharp edges as the blades for their swords. With the boons provided to them by the crystals of hard light, 
The raccoons had an army unlike any other in the Land of Light. An army that was as unmatched in spirit as it was in weaponry, as the society of the raccoons was one focused on warfare and combat, meaning nearly all its folk were deadly fighters. The librarian also found that there were indications that the forest of the west was the subject of an invasion by a blue-skinned group of people who wielded impressive weaponry of their own. While the librarian was unable to determine whether the raccoons focused on warfare rose as a response to this invasion or whether it was already in place when it occurred, she could easily determine that the raccoons were able to repel the invasion of the blues thanks to the spirit and ability of their warriors. The south was covered in a vast desert, and with coarse sands and harsh sunlight, the librarian found it hard to believe that any life could find a way to thrive there. But she soon found that the society of the desert didn't live upon the open sands, but under them. And in those vast tunnels crawling under the desert, she found various workshops and labs and automatons and machines, indicating that the culture that lived there had a huge focus on technological progress. She also found that they conducted some sort of biological experiments as well, as all over the labs were canisters that had some kind of organic mass floating inside. These weren't the extent of the experiments either, as deep in the labs were large vats filled with some of the blue-skinned people that had invaded the forests of the west, where it appeared they were being forced to undergo physical transformations. Most were being transformed into a more bestial, aggressive form, creating creatures named Dirks, but others were being transformed into larger monstrosities that were terrifying to look at and fearsome to face. Unlike the other societies in the land, there weren't any statues in the tunnels or labs or workshops, making it difficult to determine who lived there, but the librarians soon discovered that the wonders and travesties of the tunnels were the work of a race of lizards that lived in the sands of the south. Rounding out the cultures of the Land of Light was a society of bird folk that built a monastery in the caves of the snow-capped mountains of the north. Here, they lived a quiet life of religion and faith, building and praying at altars and totems, interring their dead in special catacombs in the caves of the mountains, and building a hatchery where special priests watched over the eggs of their people. While their living was simple and not driven by an obsession with progress, and they didn't have any unique substances like hyperlight or hardlight, the birds were in a society incapable of development of their own. In fact, they were responsible for creating special teleporters called rifts that allowed for instantaneous transport of matter between partner platforms. Additionally, they built a huge library in the caves of their home, where the knowledge of the world could be recorded and referred to by their people for generations. Despite the differences between these cultures, the librarian found that they all began working together to make the Land of Light a better place for them all. The most significant contribution came from the otters who got over their fear and shared the wonder of hyperlight with the others, which led to a variety of developments for the societies. The raccoons created firearms that fired bullets of hyperlight, which helped in their war with the blues. The birds were able to use the material to enhance their rifts to allow for transport across vast distances, installing one of these new platforms near the homes of each of the cultures so they could all take advantage of this new method of travel. And most notable of all, the lizards learned it could be used as a reliable fuel source. Thus, they upgraded their tunnels with lights and elevators and defensive turrets and barriers of light and many other wondrous technologies all of which were powered by hyperlight that ran through various pipes that snaked their way through the tunnels of their home. To help control the flow of the substance, the lizards installed a huge diamond-shaped pillar near their home, along with smaller modules at particular points in their infrastructure, and the pure energy of hyperlight that ran through these structures caused them to pulse with a magenta light. Of course, the lizards shared these wonders with the other societies, and soon, all four cultures had a pillar and various modules that pumped hyperlight through the vast subterranean tunnels under their homes. As societies continued to develop and exchange information with each other, a city eventually sprang up at a central point between them all, and with all of their efforts consolidated, wondrous technologies not seen anywhere else in the whole world were developed. 
making the capital city of the civilization of the Land of Light a place of unrivaled magnificence. A magnificence commemorated by grand statues of each race that were erected in the city. Included in the sprawling wonder of the capital city, the librarian found indications that the people revered a particular entity, one that took the form of a large jackal with a diamond halo around its head. The people's reverence to this being seemed to come from the jackal wielding a power that the civilization had not been able to harness yet, a power over life itself. Thus, wanting to emulate that power, the librarian found that the people of the Land of Light began working to create a perfect cell to be imbued within all sentient life, so that they could become immortal. Although there were some that didn't think it wise to mess with the nature of life and death, the work proceeded, and eventually, after the civilization harnessed the power of a great wellspring that floated above their city, they succeeded in their task and created the immortal cell. However, to their horror, what they thought would be the pinnacle of accomplishment for them turned out to be the catalyst of their downfall. Right when the cell was created, its purpose was corrupted by an entity named Judgment, who took control of the immortal cell with the inky black tendrils of its form, and used the power of the cell to bring ruin and devastation to its creators. Immediately, it caused a huge explosion at the capital city of the civilization, which completely wiped it off the face of the world. And at the same time, it released four gigantic titans upon the realm, ordering them to march upon the cultural centers of the four societies of the Land of Light and wipe them out. Many people were killed in the War of the Titans that followed, but despite the size and power and devastation of the Titans, the people of the Land of Light were able to fight them off and destroy them before they themselves could be destroyed. However, in the aftermath of the War of the Titans, all of their societies were left incredibly weakened and vulnerable, and in those weakened states, they didn't have the power and strength needed to stave off subsequent attacks on their societies. In the east, the toads of the lake invaded the stone homes of the otters to finally take control of their hyperlight. With how weak they had become, the otters couldn't fight off the invasion and were brutally wiped out by their foes. Those that were lucky enough to survive were enslaved by the amphibians, who not only took control of their precious resource, but would regularly feed their slaves to their gluttonous emperor. In the west, the raccoons had been able to fight off their titan by using special cannons that they modified with hard light, but the weapons that had been their salvation were also their doom, as some of the cannons backfired causing the hard light within them to grow out of control and trap the raccoons inside, leaving their crystallized forms as a reminder of the society that once called these forests home. Meanwhile, the hard light crystals continued to spread through the forest, warping the beasts of the woods and even seemingly growing sentience of its own. In the north, the religious society of the birds splintered and the new group, led by a priest known as Hierophant, practiced teachings that were sacrilegious to the old ways, ones that focused on sacrifice and violence. Eventually, desiring to eliminate the old ways for good, Hierophant and his followers attacked the Monastery of the Mountains and burned it to the ground, leaving them and their religion as a sole practice in the region. Nothing was spared from the destruction of the monastery, not even the hatchery that housed the eggs of the birds and although there were a few eggs that were saved by some brave priests that had managed to escape the slaughter, most lay broken and forsaken in the ruins of the monastery. After defeating their titan, the lizards of the south began to take it apart, fascinated by its structure and function, wondering if they could reverse engineer the titans so they could use them. But it wasn't meant to be, as eventually, the lizards disappeared and the only remnants of their people left in the region had no memory of the past achievements or workings of their ancestors. The librarian wasn't able to determine exactly what caused the downfall of the lizards, but seeing as how dirks were now all over the Land of Light, wreaking havoc and destruction, she thought it likely that the creatures broke out of their containment vessels and wiped out their creators. While all the societies crumbled in the aftermath of the War of the Titans, the librarian found that, before their ultimate fall, 
The people of the Land of Light had been able to seal Judgment and the Immortal Cell away deep in a vault below the remains of their former capital, where they hoped that, by being locked away, the Land of Light would be free from Judgment's influence. This was the last bit of information gathered by the librarian, as after she carved it onto the monoliths of her library, she removed her drifter armor, placed it on her desk, and took a seat, feeling she had earned a rest. She never rose from that spot again, passing away there in the quiet of her library. However, the manner of her death was much more sinister than it appeared. The whole time she was researching, the librarian was suffering from a terminal illness that appeared in the world after Judgment and the Immortal Cell were sealed away. Those that suffered from this ailment would have intense coughing fits where they would cough up blood, and these coughing spells would get progressively worse and worse until eventually the person would pass away from the disease. Of particular interest was something that happened to them during heavy coughing spells. Judgment would apparate before them and float as an ominous presence until they passed out or were violently killed by it. While these encounters were nothing more than nightmares, evidenced by the person finding they suffered no damage from the dark entity when they awoke some time later, the fact that Judgment appeared to them during these bad moments indicated that the disease they suffered from was linked to the entity, meaning despite being locked away from the Land of Light, Judgment was still able to inflict harm and death upon its people. In order for the Land of Light to truly be free from its influence, Judgment and the immortal cell it drew its power from would have to be destroyed. That was a task that the Jackal entity hoped to see done, and for countless years it appeared to those suffering from Judgment's illness, giving them a brief but startling history of the Land of Light, and then pushed them to go to the immortal cell and destroy it. A blue drifter from a far off land was one of those that had been visited by the Jackal, and not wanting to die just yet, he traveled to the Land of Light hoping that by following the Jackal, he could be cured of his illness and live to see another day. Shortly after he arrived, the drifter had one of his coughing fits and fell unconscious in the wilds of the land, but before he could succumb to the elements or to the monsters that lurked there, he was picked up by another drifter, one wearing pink armor, who brought him to their home in a small village in the Land of Light. This village had been built by the surviving people of the land to try and start a new life in the aftermath of Judgment's devastation, but the dangers of the land meant the village needed to be protected at all times, and while they had guards to protect against the dirks and other dangers of the wild, its fiercest protector was the Pink Drifter, who acted as the de facto guardian of the entire community. Coincidentally enough, the Drifter found that this town had been built around the elevator that descended to the vault that contained Judgment and the Immortal Cell, meaning that by chance he had found what he was looking for. Of course, the elevator was still sealed up, so the Drifter made his way out into the Land of Light to see if he could find a way to unlock the vault. And as he explored the ruins of the land, he couldn't help but feel constantly reminded of the impending doom looming over him. There were the corpses of the otters being consumed by the fungi of their home, returning their physical forms to the dirt, a reminder of the natural process that his own body would eventually undergo. There were the bones of the birds lying in their catacombs, reminders of the memories of their ancestors, making him think how he would be remembered. There were the frozen bodies of the raccoons, who seemed to defy death by being frozen in the crystals, yet that very condition also prevented them from living, making him think about how linked life and death were, about how it was impossible to have life without death. And there were the twisted experiments of the lizards, a reminder of how dangerous it could be to try and play with the mechanisms of life. All of these reminders prompted self-reflection in the drifter, and his thoughts on his own condition began to change. While exploring, he also came upon the Guardian, where he learned that they too were looking for the Immortal Cell. The Guardian also revealed that they had had an encounter with Judgment themselves, meaning they suffered from the same illness that the Drifter had. And as the Drifter subsequently encountered them in the other areas of the land, he learned that the Guardian had taken up the quest for the Cell 
after Judgment's sickness took away their family. The Drifter also saw the ailment take a deeper and deeper hold of them, till eventually, the Guardian passed away. Before they passed, though, at each of their meetings, the Guardian pointed out the location of some of the modules of the area to the Drifter, indicating that if he could deactivate those, then he would be able to reach and activate the Pillar of the region, which would unlock one of the seals upon the elevator to the vault. There were four locks upon the elevator, so the Drifter would have to raise the pillar in each area, and with the help provided by the Guardian, the Drifter was able to defeat the sacrilegious Hierophant in the north. He was able to end the Toad Emperor's reign of terror in the east. He was able to fight through the dozens of raccoons and their crazed leader that were unleashed from their crystal prisons in the west, and he was able to destroy the experiments of the lizards in the labs to the south to find and activate the pillars unlocking the way to the abyss. The drifter then descended down into its depths, walked through the ruins of the ancient civilization, passed a curiously familiar statue, and then came upon his goal, the immortal cell. As soon as he approached it though, Judgment appeared and attacked him, intending to defend the source of its power. However, whether by his own power honed through his journey, or through a power given to him by the Jackal Entity, the Drifter was able to overcome the Dark Entity and destroy the Immortal Cell. Its destruction destabilized the underground lab that housed it, and it began to crumble around the Drifter, who, despite Judgment's destruction, felt sicker than ever. As he made an escape, he saw the Jackal Entity and followed it out to a familiar campsite. He leaned against the large statue too weakened by his ailment to continue on, and with the jackal looking over him, he sat down for a rest as the lab crumbled around him. In the darkness of the vault, a vision came to him, of the jackal departing behind large stone doors as rubble fell before it, of the wellspring above the land of light disappearing now that the immortal cell was gone, and of a breathtaking view of the land of light free from the corrupting influence of judgment, all thanks to him. It was a view that he himself never got to experience, as sitting there in the rubble of the vault, the drifter passed away. And yet in that final moment, there wasn't fear, there wasn't despair or hopelessness, there was only acceptance and peace. And with that peace, the story of Hyperlight Drifter comes to an end. I began this video with the quote, a picture is worth a thousand words. And while I've used thousands of words to tell the story of Hyperlight Drifter, they don't quite hit the mark of what it's truly like to experience. And there's a very good reason for that. By using next to no words to explain the events of the game, Heart Machine hasn't just crafted a story, they've crafted a piece of art that has different messages, meanings, and interpretations that depend on the one consuming it. While I've tried to use some words to describe what I think the messages behind the game are, they might not come close to explaining the feelings you feel when you play the game. After all, art is in the eye of the beholder, so I encourage you to reflect on your own thoughts and feelings and what the story means to you and try to put words to them. Using your own words to express your feelings will be so much more satisfying than anything I could say. And if you have the courage to share those thoughts, ideas, feelings, and theories, feel free to. I know I would love to hear them and maybe get a new perspective on Hyperlight Drifter that I hadn't had before. But otherwise, that'll be it for this one. If you have any questions on the events of the game, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Before I go, I'd like to remind you that every episode is uploaded to Spotify as well as on YouTube, so feel free to listen over there if that'll be easier for you. Lastly, I'd like to give a shout out to my little boy Kieran. I love you buddy, and I miss you so much. All right, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching and see you later. Using your own words to gauge your feelings. Yeah, that's cool.